93 in the waiting room. Wow. It should be interesting. We'll go over 100 by the end. Welcome, welcome, welcome in, everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Care Patrol is an aging care navigation firm. And that simply means that when you have clients, patients, friends who are in the midst of their healthcare journey or even planning one, give us a call. We'll talk to them at no charge. We're paid by providers if we match them to providers who meet their needs. And we often end up matching them to providers that meet their needs, but are a Medicare service or other service from which we're not paid. So Really, you know, my prayer every morning is that we have the opportunity to help people, and we do, and we get paid about 40% of the time, so I think that's a pretty good mix, quite honestly, uh, but nonetheless, that's who Care Patrol is. Our education is part of our task, we feel, to educate our clients about what the options are, what those cost, and how you qualify, and how you go about getting in or getting acceptance by a service or a provider of any type. Uh, and we welcome all the provider types that are on this call. This is an ethics presentation today with Dr. Nicole Brown, who has been so gracious to work with me throughout my scheduling difficulties this month. We welcome her back and look forward to this. This is 1.0 hour. We are accredited by the Alabama Board of Nursing, and we are also accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work. And each of them credits this hour with 1.0 hours. Uh, in order to receive the uh, hour, you must complete an evaluation. And this evaluation is password protected. And the reason we do this protected system of doing evaluations is it allows for us to say to the board of social work that this is a live hour or a classroom hour and not a recorded hour. So in order to uh, uh, access the evaluation at the conclusion, after you hear the password, I'm going to read to you, those of you who are ready and uh, participating by phone or not seeing a screen, but want to get the evaluation link. I'll read it for you now. The evaluation link is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash these are all uppercase letters Y, G, J as in Juliet, R, S as in Sam, nine, three. That's our evaluation link for today. Um, we do encourage discussion. And so we really want to hear your voice. I know that Dr. Brown and I both feel that, that your voice adds much more flavor to ours and much greater experience for the listener to hear your perspective and observations and outcomes in addition to those of me and or the speaker. So we do encourage you to let us hear your voice and feel that this is a safe place. If you'd like, I can unmute you. Or if you would like to use the chat room, either move your cursor to the top of the screen or to the bottom a black bar will appear with the word chat. Click that and let us hear from you. Uh, and so now, again, this is an ethics presentation. It is a password protected evaluation. We give the password at the end. And I'm so very happy uh, and grateful to welcome you, Dr. Brown, again today. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you spending your lunch with us. I um, want to say before we even I even start that um, some of these things you may find controversial, some of these things you may not agree with, um, and there 
is room for discussion, just like Sean said. Um, but for the most part, these are the core crux, the foundations and cornerstones for ethics. Because I am a social worker by profession, I decided to go with social work ethics and core ethics. Um, however, like I said, these things we can discuss um, further. All right, so who has a seat at the table? And I call it the seat at the table because the question is, who is a mandated reporter? And so a mandated reporter is anyone who is a professional that is delegated to, um, and, and that engages for a living by profession with children. And um, they are um, in their capacity as a professional engaged with children for duration of their eight hour day. Um, there are laws that state that um, clergy are um, mandated reporters as well, but that is somewhere in between gray area. And the reason I say gray area is because there are some um, members of the, com the faith community who um, opt out of mandated reporting for several different reasons. But the bedrock of what we're talking about as far as mandated reporting is the health and safety of children. And so sometimes and most times that trumps the their obligation or their um, perceived obligation as a member of the religious community. So want to make sure that I say again, that if you as a professional spend a significant amount of time with a child as a teacher, um, as a social worker, in a child care setting, as an educator of any kind, or if you come into contact with children in your day-to-day -day dealings as a professional, you are considered a mandated reporter. Even if you work in a hospital and you are a phlebotomist, or that person works in a school, but they're the janitor, or I'm sorry, um, they are a part of the custodial team or a bus driver those people are still considered a part of the mandated reporting team and they have a seat at the table. Okay, so I, a part of my uh, studies for my doctoral program was um, child abuse and neglect, mandated reporting. Um, and one of my focuses was uh, child sexual abuse. However, I studied it all um, as a broad spectrum. And so here is a timeline of what child abuse reporting, funding federally, statewide is, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, my grandmother just used to say, there's nothing new under the sun. And um, all I wanna say about that is there may have been or have been some form of abuse going on with children, with adolescents, teenagers, since the beginning of time. As we know, we have um, child brides that are children under the ages of 18. And so um, for all intents and purposes in the United States, that is still considered child abuse. I understand that there are different views on that depending on what state you're in, depending on consent or ages of consent, ages and stages of consent. But at the baseline bottom, um, that, that's basically what I'm saying there. There are laws in place now that provide funding to each state for mandated reporting, which fund um, your local child services programs, which fund your um, child abuse and neglect teams, and uh, funding for um, forensic interviews and other um, and other things that are that may be thought of by the state and that the federal government provides some type of latitude for the states to decide what they want to use that money on. However, it has to be used for child well-being and child endangerment and the prevention of child abuse. Those are written into the law. So you Excuse can't me. use the money. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Dr. Brown. We have a question from a Ms. Grammis. Uh, hey. Will there be a discussion of ethics in adult cases in this presentation? Um, I can tailor that because some of these things you can 
curtail from children to adults. So yes, we will be talking about adults as well. Um, right. Actually, this particular, what you see in the timeline, adults are, con are included within. However, what I have here talks a lot about children, but where you see children, you can put adult there because the law and the, the funding funnels down the same way. So the wording um, here in my presentation says, says child abuse, but in the law, the laws talk about child abuse prevention and adult abuse prevention as well. The, the money funnels down the same way. Does that answer your question? Hope so. It answers mine. I, I hope it does everyone else. Okay. And thank you for being flexible. Oh, no problem. These things are older than child than the child abuse laws and the adult abuse laws. All of these things. And we think about like Roe versus Wade. Wow, that one long ago, but there were no adult protection abuse laws on the books, nor were there child abuse prevention um, laws on the books. These things are older than that. One of my favorite movies is Pretty Woman. It's older than abuse prevention and mandated reporting. Okay. So when we're talking, when I did my um, my thesis, I looked at the 12, there were 12 grand challenges of social work at that time. They've since added another. But here are some of the stats. And how much money is spent per year per person. This is not a collective, right? This is per person that has been indicated um, that a child abuse uh, or neglect situation has occurred or an adult, these numbers are the same for children and adults. However, this that statistic that says one in seven children experienced child abuse last year, I do not have that statistic for adults. I did have that statistic for children. And when you look at how much money is spent per year and how many cases, 3.1 million cases of child abuse or neglect, for adults, that looks like 1.1 million, just so that you know we can balance that out since the question was asked. I do know the information, it's just some of, most of it's not here. I would have to just tell it to you. Um, this is a lot of money that goes into, we're talking about um, forensic interviews for adults or children. So what I'm talking about is for adults or children. We're talking about forensic interviews. Forensic interviews is a medical interview that it, um, medical exam that is done for an adult or a child where they take pictures, they take samples, they take blood. And then there is a um, interview process that goes on where that there's it's a fact discovery or discovery of facts for that particular um, survivor. And this- I just wanna be clear here. You're saying that, that, that one in seven children have a forensic interview have experienced abuse last year, this to 2022. Because okay. I was going to just wonder then, I mean, because I mean, how many children then that don't have a forensic interview might be? Reported? Several more for every, this, this, these statistics are only for those children that we know about. Lord. For those that we know about, not, and not all abuse and neglect are reported. So this is for the reported. So you can go down, if you're in Walmart, count every seventh child. Ah, I do. If you're in Walmart, count every 10, uh, 10th adult, one, two, nine, 10. That would be what you're looking at as far as reports are concerned and those who, um, where, this, where the monies come in. So solutions that have been tried in the past, um, they've tried child-focused education. Adult-focused education has also so uh, educating the potential uh, survivor or the potential or the potential um, person who's in danger. Um, parent education, but we can also parlay that into health caregiver education. Um, research has been done on both sides of the aisle as far as for children and for adults. 
teacher education because children spend a lot of time with teachers. But then there's also education that's done for um, those who take care of our, our adults in um, care homes. Um, there's online training, there are paper forms, there's all kinds of stuff that's been tried. Uh, but nothing has been able to stop, eradicate um, abuse of children or adults. So this is a synopsis of what the code of ethics looks like or what is intended for for the NAS um, for social workers in the NASW. Um, what it talks about is identifying what the core values for social work is, where our mission is. It summarizes our ethical principles and how we are to conduct ourselves as uh, social workers at all levels, BSW, MSW, and myself at the DSW level. Um, those of us that are licensed and unlicensed, if you are identifying yourself as, or if you're in a role as, a social worker, this is what I mean, um, if you have a degree in the social work field and your title says you are such and such social worker, you are governed under this code of ethics. Some of you have may have your own personal ethics that may conflict with the NASW code of ethics. However, if you present yourself as a social worker, if you are employed as a social worker, regardless of what your personal ethics are, this is what you will be, um, the rubric that you will be governed under right here. Okay, so there are meta ethics that talk about the analytic, the analytical thinking. Um, and the meaning and the use of what's right, what's good, um, what's dutiful, right? Then there are normative ethics that talk about the attempts to give answers to moral questions and to moral problems. And if that, if that thing that you're thinking about is morally right, morally wrong, and what your actions should be. And then the descriptive ethics talks about, you know, the beliefs, and how they are to be acted out, what you should do as a result of, and if you are morally wrong or morally right. So these are things that people kind of toil about sometimes. And these are things that are, you know, usually um, people put on the internet or they're, you know, think tanks about what's ethically right, what's morally right, what's considered your duty to um, provide this particular information or to divulge this, this information. So when you get into the who, what, when, why, and where <laughs> about any of this, um, we talked about the who, that's anyone that comes into contact with someone who they suspect is um, being abused or neglected. And the what is, you know, is it emotional abuse? Is it sexual abuse? Is it physical abuse? And one of the things that I want to point out is suspected. You do not have to know 100% whether adult or child is being sexually abused, mentally abused. You don't have to know that. You have to have a suspicion and suspect and have... um. You don't have to have evidentiary cause or fiduciary cause, and that's that's all legal stuff. But basically what that means is you don't have to come in with a, some papers and say, here, this is, this is how I know, or a video that says, here, this is what I caught on tape. Be great if you had it, although you want to be careful about that too, because there are some gray areas that come in there too. When you should report immediately. There is no thinking about it. There's no, I want to toil over it. I'm going to think about it. What did I hear? What did I see? To protect yourself professionally, ethically, um, globally, report it immediately. It is not our responsibility for fact finding. That is what our DHR is for. That is what law enforcement is for. Our obligation is to make the report. Their obligation is to investigate the report. 
So do that orally within 24 hours. I wouldn't wait the 24 hours, depending on what you saw, depending on what you hear, depending on what you suspect. I would not wait that long. Um, I would go ahead and do it immediately. You follow that up with something written, a fax, an email, a phone call, something. So someone knows that you have made that report. And I like to say, or I had a boss that used to say all the time that they like to get things off their desk as soon as they see them. I would say that too. As soon as you find something out, go ahead and move it off your desk. Go ahead and get that information in. All right, so the where. Where are you supposed to report these things? To your local, I'm gonna use DHR because that's what we call it here, Department of um, Human Resources. Um, other places call it DIFUS, um, DFACS. No, it, it basically is your human services agency. Um, law enforcement, you can call a sheriff's office or a police department and a licensing agency. So say for instance, you're talking about a child care facility or an adult care facility. Not only are you gonna make a report to the local DHR, you're gonna make a report to their licensing agency. So if they're, um, even if they say they're independently licensed and they're independently standing, they have a governing board somewhere. They have a license through someone. Make a report also to that licensing um, body. I put on here removal of children or removal of adults because we cannot make citizens arrest. We cannot make citizens removals. Those have to come from our local state, local or state agencies like a DHR or a local law enforcement. They are the only agencies that can remove an adult or a child from a home. We can't do that on our own fruition. We cannot do that. Um, that would be considered kidnapping to take someone out of their home um, because you suspect something that has gone on. Um, most definitely dial 911 or make an immediate call to law enforcement. If you see something, say something in that moment. Don't leave that person alone, especially if it's an adult or most definitely a child. But do not get caught up in the um, back and forth or the thought that you have to make a citizen's arrest or a citizen's removal because then that opens you up for another ethical issue, which is kidnapping. Um, please don't do that. Dr. Brown, would you educate me a minute? So you were saying report to DHR, and I know that makes sense for children, and I know that makes sense for adults over 62 with Adult Protective Services, but what happens to the folks in between? You make the report to DHR, too. DHR has two divisions. One is a CAN unit that deals with child abuse and neglect, and then they also have an Adult Protective Services unit. I used to work in both. Um, and adults are considered, you know, if children are considered birth to, I guess now we're saying 26, 26 to death is considered adults. So you would still call the same agency and they still make the same, um, invest, they still, the, the same investigation happens. Just one deals more with the safety of children and the other deals with the safety of adults. Okay, I've been mistaken. I thought the age cut off was 62. So thank you for correcting me on that. No, sir. No. Um, there are some gray areas there. Gray areas are like domestic violence. There's a gray area there because you we, they think about and they talk about that person's autonomy to leave. Um, so that's an example of when there may be an issue of can you make a report to DHR about someone who is in a domestic violence um, situation? Usually they're going to... Um, send you over to law enforcement instead when there, there's gray areas like that. Got you. Mm -hmm. But I want to also say that law enforcement and DHR work in tandem. So if you make a report to DHR, most likely they're going to make a report to police if they feel the need. But don't fall into the cracks of saying, oh, okay, well, I made this report to DHR. I don't have to report it to law enforcement. If you feel and you're, if you have your gut feeling says, make that report to law enforcement, I would. You would rather make the report and not need it than need it and not have had it in a lot of situations, even in domestic violence situations. 
you would rather have the report on file and not need it than need it at some point and not have anything on record. I'm sorry to interrupt. Ms. Sasser asked maybe if you misspoke about age of adults for reporting in Alabama, she says it's 19, not 26. Well, what they talk about um, right now is because children can stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. So, and here's another thing you have to consider that if a child is in DHR care or if they are, um, have been a part of a family preservation case, they are still eligible for that until they're 26. So there are some discrepancies about what law says and what DHR does in some instances. So there are some gray areas that occur with, with this timing and these dates. For instance, there is um, a law that said that a child legal age of consent is 14. But yeah, I saw that face, Sean. Yeah, legal, a legal age of consent is 14. However, legal age of consent is 14 in some gray areas, not all. That's why I said 26, because 26, you can still have your child on your insurance. And if you can still have your child on your in, they're in your insurance and they need a forensic interview, they will be considered a child and it will go on the child side of their medical record. It's a Ms. Durs is, uh, is asking, or says in fact, that a child is still, or, or someone can be in foster care until age 22. Mm -hmm. It can be under, that is correct. With the gray area being, there are some gray areas with that as well. That has to do with DSM diagnosis and other criteria where Mr. they will take I'm them sorry. in again. Mr. Casalaro says, in quotes, adult in need of protective services, quote, end quote, means a person 18 years of age and older per mandatory reporting requirement that mm -hmm. elderly Alabama. Mm -hmm. Yep. However, like I said, there are gray areas in between these laws. There are gray areas that have to be considered. So none of these laws are black and white. Um, so I hear what you're saying, and I agree that those particular statutes may be in the law. However, if they fall within gray area, then what you said gets null and void, and what they do is go ahead with their investigation. Okay, so really, I mean, from the outside looking in, um considering someone a child until 26, I would think would render them greater protection than, than cutting them off at 18. Am I wrong about that? Yes. In, in, in most instances, I would believe so. Yes. Okay. But there is a, a, a such thing as a legal age of adulthood. Just think about it like this. At 18, you can vote, but you can't drink. Right. At 18, you can do some things that you can't. 21, you can do some things that you can't. Um, at 19, you can do some things that you can't. For example, not in this topic, but just to give an example, you have to be 19 to buy a cigarette lighter. You have to be 19. I didn't know Those that. Some, yeah. I just found that out myself. I didn't think you had to be a certain age to buy a cigarette lighter, but they want your um, ID. So I'll, I have a, another sort of response about being a child until you're a certain age. So I watched Bachelor in Paradise, and I'll admit it. And the other night, the, there was a, back, I guess, Bachelorette on there who was 32 or 34, and she was new. And this other young man was trying to talk her up, and she asked his age. He said 24, and she stopped him, and she said, oh, no, your frontal cortex hasn't fused yet. I'm not interested. And so, I, I mean, I know that's kind of silly, but in a way, we do hear more and more about people remaining or, or maturing in certain ways slower than in the past. Right, because the research shows that although you may be physically, you look like a big girl or I'm just, I'm not insulting anybody, but you look like a big girl. This is what I tell my daughter. 
her brain isn't fully developed until she's about between 25 to 27. So right. reasoning and judgment have not, um, those parts of the brain have not matured. And the new research is showing that, that the brain hasn't matured um, to take account for those things. Okay, so, Tarn says, uh, you're so correct. Uh, I'm sorry, his comment faded on me. I'm going to read this because it's nice. Uh, Mr. Turner said, uh, Dr. Brown is so correct. Um, oh, wow. There's so many comments. Dr. Brown is correct regarding gray areas, and that's why it is so important, underscore, to report and let the decision makers determine the action to be taken. And then relieving to know their exceptions to the age criteria, there are such circumstances, different circumstances out there for each and every individual um, and then, uh, that was it. So, um, I appreciate anyway, that. Sorry to interrupt. No, I appreciate that because yeah, there are gray areas. They don't, let me just go ahead and tell you, they're not going to publicize the gray area. They're not because if they publicize the gray area, then everybody's going to be calling about any and everything. I know that what I said, you probably, your eyebrows just raised up. I, there, this, this is what I know from sitting at the table behind the scenes. They're not going to publicize. But if you report it, they have no choice but to investigate it. So I'll put it there for you to kind of decide it there. Um, generally, the penalty for not reporting is a misdemeanor. However, depending on what you're not reporting, there's the gray area again, anywhere from five hundred to ten thousand dollar fine jail time loss of employment and a civil lawsuit that's a great that's a great area but there are protections and i want to most definitely highlight good faith reporting good faith reporting means that you are making report out of the goodness of your heart with the intent of protecting a child or an adult who you believe is in danger and that renders you immune from civil and criminal liability so long as it cannot be proven that your intent was malicious. I was going to stop right there just for a little bit um, because pe some people don't report because they say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be sued. If your intent is to help someone and not Oh, well, this and this is going to I'm going far out into left field, y'all. So don't follow me, but you can listen. You know, that's my ex-boyfriend's sister and I don't like their relationship. So I'm going to make a report. Right. And then in the part of the investigation, it is found that that's your ex-boyfriend's little sister. And you all had a something, something, something and a tiff about something, something, something. You could be held liable for that. But if this is a child and your intention really is to protect the child, to protect the adult, there is something called good faith reporting. There is no, you cannot be sued live civilly or criminally for that. Um, your name is confidential unless you tell people that you made the report. Um, and as far as your employment, there cannot be any retaliation um, those are things that you yourself can turn around and make civil or criminal um, litigation about. So when we're, oh, I thought about, well, when we thought about why people don't report, you have something called loss aversion. And that talks about when you are, it's a phenomenon where a real or potential loss is perceived by someone. So rather than providing additional information and, and, and reasoning, that person just decides that there is too much emotional and psychological cost that outweighs them doing something good and it's more severe than the gain. So for instance, the pain of losing $100 is often greater than if you found $100 on the ground little bit interesting, but that's what loss aversion talks about. If you lost something, then you would be a little bit more uh, upset about it than if you were to gain something. So losing here means if I make this report, will such and such be mad at me? 
Will my coworkers be mad? Will my family be mad? Will the family of the person I made the report about be mad? And then we're talking about status quo bias, which basically means I don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. I don't want people looking at me. And it's based on emotion. And that you want to prefer to be, you prefer to be in the status quo. You don't want to be like there's a sea of purple and you do not want to be the gold speck in the purple, right? So you want to be just like everybody else and you don't want any any shine or any accolade, any spot laid on you. And then there is cognitive dissonance and it describes mental discomfort that results from holding two conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes. I believe that I should report, but this or this or this. So it's a mental conflict within yourself. Um, when your beliefs don't line up with your actions, I should have made that report, but I didn't because, or I saw this child or this adult with bruises, but I didn't, you like, you make some type of um, excuse up in your mind about why you didn't report that. Ms. Cadell is saying that, uh, I think she's saying this in a supportive way. We just need to understand that if we report in a gray area quotes, we need to be prepared to advocate in order to facilitate a real investigation. I believe that reports need to be written as well as oral on phone to be effective. Yes, that's what one of the, pre one of the previous slides was asking you to make that report immediately, to follow that up and make that phone call, to make the, then follow that up with an email or a fax, to check in and make a phone call. Hey, did you get my fax? So that the burden, the burden of proof is not on you just that you make the report. So again, why people don't report the outcome? Well, what if nothing happens? Well, like I said, we're not the fight fact finders. We are just providing the information. And here's what happens. Even when we make a report about something, it doesn't just go away, even if it's not indicated. And not indicated means that there a, a report was made, an investigation was done, and they did not find plausible information to indicate that said person for adult abuse or child abuse, they still keep it in a database. So if there is another report that comes up about that particular child or that particular adult and that particular perpetrator, they start lining those things up so it's such that there is a paper trail for that particular person and that particular child. So keep that in mind. So don't get discouraged thinking, oh, well, they didn't do anything because you never know what happens. There could have been, you, you could have been the third report. So with the third report happening, then they're going to make another step. But what you do need to understand is they're not going to call you and tell you what's going on with the investigation. They're not going to do that. It's not happening. They're not going to call you and say, hey, Miss Green, we've decided that we're going to go forward with this case. They're not going to do that because at that point, if it's a case, they can't talk to you about it. If they're going to make it criminal, they can't talk to you about it. But if they're going to take it to court, if, if it's going to a grand jury, if, then they will be in contact. That is why you have to provide your information that is confidential, because if they need you, your information, or they need you to make a statement to the grand jury, they're going to need your information because that builds a case against the perpetrator. That includes adults or children, meaning um, abuse, okay? Um, they're Like I, the, all of these, they're concerned about the family's reaction. Um, you know, some people want to take it into their own hands and they want to do the investigation. Um, let the professionals, let me, let the professionals do it. Um, is there imminent harm? Maybe, maybe not, but that's not for us to um, argue it's for us to report. Ms. Cadell so, has a question. It's, uh, she says, it's reassured me to learn that reports remain in a database, even mm -hmm. if the report is deemed, quote, unfounded. How mm -hmm. long do unfounded reports remain in the database? They never go away. They never go away. They never go away. You know how you should keep your taxes for about seven to 10 years? Well, they'll stay in the database because they stay in this, you know, imaginary cloud, but you never know when you have to bring that thing 
everything down. So what it, what it does is it hits the names hit, the birthdays hit. I'm going to talk to you about what you need to have so that when you make a report, because what you want to make sure is that your those those key factors hit when it goes up into the cloud. Um, the different types of abuse for adults and for children. This that is, what's is very reassuring to to feel like that maybe some report you made does lead to some prosecution of someone that's that should be prosecuted. It does. Ms. Sasser says if you don't receive another report within five years, you can request the report of unfounded to be expunged from your record. DHR will expunge it in those cases. Yes, but there there is gray area there. But yes, you are you are correct, but they have to know to do that. And then there's a um, process that has to happen for it to, it doesn't just go away. There's a process, but yes, there is a process for that. Um, this is the definition for physical abuse. What we're talking about is injury. Um, and this is for children and adults. So where you see child, put adult there because that can be bruises, cuts, scrapes, all of that excessively um, and that these things are injuries that are done on purpose and not through an accident. So I, I'm throwing, kicking, punching, striking, shaking a child or an adult um, or restricting their breathing. So choking, asphyxiation, putting a bag over someone's head. You're going to punish them or they're going to punish them. Those things are considered physical abuse. Adults and children across the board. Um, here uh, so are some other examples of what are considered physical abuse. Um, purposely giving someone poison, alcohol, something that you know they're allergic to. Probably didn't think about that. I know that such my husband or such and such's mom is allergic to shrimp. So I'm going to put shrimp juice in her X, Y, Z. And someone knows about that, that's considered abuse. Because you could cause deadly harm to someone if you know that they are allergic to shrimp, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, all of those things. It's considered abuse and it's illegal. Um, I want to uh, talk about extreme, I want to highlight extreme abuse, which happens to adults and children, more so sometimes adults. You're restricting them from going to the bathroom. You are putting them in a cage. You're locking them in their room. You're putting them in their jerry chair. You're putting them in the Hoyer lift and you're not allowing them to get out of the Hoyer lift. You're leaving them in the bathroom, in the, in the, in the tub for way too long. You are not allowing them to take a bath for weeks, for days. Um, you know those cages that you crate dogs in? I, per I, have, I have animals, I have fur babies, and we crate them to teach them about um, um, B and B, not in the house, right? Bile and, and bladder. Well, you can't put some, you, of course, you know, you can't put a child or an adult in one of those, but people do. Or you have them locked up in a room in your basement. Um, and then you just slide down maybe some crackers and water. That's abuse. That's extreme, but it's still considered abuse. Or you're providing them with something, like I said, that will make them sick or with not enough substance so that they can sustain life. Sexual abuse is something that people walk the tightrope about. What is sexual abuse? What, what is considered sexual abuse. Um, it is, there are a lot of things that are considered sexual abuse. Um, it can be the interaction between a child and an adult, a child and a child where one is older than the other. As far as adults are concerned, you wouldn't call it sexual abuse. You would call it, um, there are other words that are, are used for that domestic violence. Um, is, is covered up under sexual abuse in some in some instances. But as far as children are concerned, um, and for the and for adults, voyeurism, 
where you're wanting to look at their naked body or exhibitionism, where you're taking pictures of an adult or a child. Um, there can be some touching and non-touching things. I know some of this talk may be uncomfortable for some. Um, here's some other um, information about that. Prostitution. Now that we have these, these um, what is it called, OnlyFans, some of these people, some, some adults, elderly adults or adults that are not in their um, mental capacity maybe are participating not on their own will, but being made to participate, um, threatening someone with sexual abuse or threatening someone that you're going to put their information out there. Um, not the por porno uh, pornography or um, say, for instance, you have someone that is taking pictures or has video or pictures of someone in an intimate act, adult or child pornography. Let's talk about some gray area. Mm -hmm. uh, sexting, as far as children, our children are concerned. That is considered pornography. Two children sending pictures between the two it is still considered sexting, it's still considered ch child pornography. If your child or teen then takes that picture and sends it to anybody else's child or teen, that is considered pornography. Your child would be charged with pornography. If that particular agency, school, or parent wants to press charges against your child, there it is most likely that it will it will be done. Um, if that is, if you are, you say, for instance, there's some girl, there was an instance where I was a part of where a friend was changing her top in front of a friend on, um, they were on like a Google meet or something. And the other friend snapshotted her taking her shirt off. She sent that picture to a group of her other friends, that child and every child that opened the text message and saw it was charged with child pornography. Please listen to me. If your child or teenager receives naked pictures, half naked pictures of anybody's child and they open it, you open yourself up to litigation. That's it. Um, if you have an adult that is using the internet in any type of way to lure children in, to get them to take their tops off, to take their bottoms off, to um, simulate sex. That is considered child pornography. You can, they can be um, charged with child pornography. Any, um, any photographs, any still shots. I'm trying to make sure I cover things, but I think I have it here. Um, and it says to solicit a child 15 or younger, but as long as that child is still in high school, you have a problem. You have a problem. If your child is 17 and a half and their girlfriend is 16 and a half, you got a problem. And there goes that gray area again. And then some people will say, well, their parents know about it. Still got a problem. Um, I put this here because if you know of a child or an adult that you, that is not a, someone that is not actively having sexual intercourse, maybe an older adult has decided that their loved one or their significant other has passed away and they're not having sex, but they have, they now have an STI. Where did that STI come from? Okay. Unexplained injuries to the child or the adult's genitals, where did that happen? Especially if they're in a care facility, where did that happen? Because I know how your four-year lift works and it does not go between your legs. Um, suspicious behavior or verbiage that comes from a child or an adult who may, an adult who may not be in their right mind, but they're talking, their, their verbiage is, you're like, okay, well, where's that coming from? What do you mean by that? Ears should perk up, eyebrows should perk up a little bit too. 
the great I'll talk some more about the gray area. Um, and we talked about this. I already said this sexting, photographs, pictures, Snapchat. You have a problem. All right. So neglect looks like you, that person, or some form of life sustaining life sustaining information life sustaining morsels are being withheld from a person food clothes shelter medical care education for adults well, that's going to that's definitely going to look like food shelter um well you're not giving me your i'm not your payee on your check uncle such and such so i'm not feeding you until you sign it over that's happened or you got a bad grade on such and such. So I am not going to, I'm not feeding you. The only thing that you can wear is this one thing right here. And I don't care if it's stinky, I'm not washing it. That's a problem. Um, you wanna think about what, these neglectful things due to a person's mental mental psyche, their emotional um, well-being. Um, and then you also want to think about other things like if you are failing or someone is failing, say for instance, a pregnant mother is failing to or withholding prenatal care or prenatal exposure or a caregiver is withholding prenatal exposure to um, a pregnant mother, then that's considered neglect. Um, to ensure that a child is being educated. Uh, now, there, here's a gray area there because homeschool is a thing. And just because you take a child or you know someone that took a child out of school, that's not educational neglect. However, the gray area comes in is if that child is not being educated anywhere, right? All right, so let's talk. I have some, um, so babysitting. This is one that always comes up. Babysitting, how old can a child be to babysit? How old should an elderly adult be so that they are still in their right mind and you feel comfortable with them babysitting? Is it 90 and grandma has Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Um, and how long should they be left alone with the child or with another adult? Those are ethical considerations that have to be thought about. Um, a child under age blank should not provide child care to their sibling or to another child. Then you also have to think about, well, um, a child at age, I'll just say seven, who is placed in an, a, a caregiver role, they're subject to the same time restrictions of being left alone as the child that they are watching. Think about that. You leave an eight-year-old at home with a two-year-old. Okay, so how long is too long to leave a seven-year-old by themselves? And then how long is too long to leave a two-year-old by themselves? And then what do those time limits look like? Ms. Dursis says this is a gray area that age is not as important as the capability and responsibility of the child or elderly adult, which I would agree. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But au contraire, does your seven-year-old know how to use a fire extinguisher? Does your seven-year-old know how to put out a grease fire? Does your seven-year-old know how to... Um, call for help if there is a home invasion. So those are the gray areas. You're right. They are, those are the gray areas. And there are several gray areas that we live in. Um, then there's mental and emotional abuse, which talk about, you know, isolating a person, making them feel less than, rejecting them, um, and providing and not providing them with the emotional stability and well-being from um, the best and optimal mental health that they could be in. Secrecy. Well, one in three women, one in seven men. 
And that could be, um, well, I, I should say male and female, but one in three is for female, one in seven is for male. And the number does not negate the age of how they go about making reports. So how to, how to handle disclosures? Of course, please listen and assess for their safety. But while you're assessing for their safety, in the back of your mind, you need to be assessing for making this report, okay? Um, and it does say do not notify caregivers because if the perpetrator is the caregiver, you don't want to trip off the perpetrator. That is the only reason you would do that. But if you have a small child that needs help, and you need to get the small, so you have to use your own, you know, decorum there and what you feel is, is necessary. But if the child is saying, I'm being hurt by such and such, such and such is their caregiver, probably not a good idea to go ahead and notify them that you're making that report. Um, and here's an acronym that, tell, that talks about um, how you can position yourself in the best possible light so that you can get that report from that child or from that adult and make them feel safe while you're doing it. You also want to reassure them, tell them thank you for you know, trusting me with this information. Um, do respect their rights, meaning they're telling you, they're not telling everybody else, meaning don't pass it off on someone else because you don't wanna deal with it. You have to be the one what to say um, uh, goes along with what I was just talking about. You have to let them know that if they're thinking about or if someone is going to harm them or that they're going to harm themselves, that you have to make a report. So you have to be care You have to be truthful with them about what you're going to do. Don't lie. Ms. Siggers has a comment, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know what are the, the, the ethical implications for on um, mandated report. I know I went back a little bit when by the time it gets to you, a doctor has had it, a nurse has had it, then they pass it on to the social worker. That was my question. What are the I'm there you with know, you and I rode that boat too. I'm there okay. with you and I rode the boat. This is how you're gonna roll that boat. <laughs> in your documentation, you're gonna put that in your documentation. That is how you CYA. Okay. Thank you're you. gonna put it in there. Mm-hmm. You're going to say that all these this information here is what you, you need to know the who, the when, the why, what they said. Don't make anything up. You put in quotation marks what that adult or that child said. And if you they say, hey, I told my doctor, I told, you know, the school counselor, I told such and such, but nobody did nothing. Put that in quotation marks. That's how you're going to see why. And um, even if they let me see if that's next. OK. I say again, don't use your own words. Use that person, that child, or that adult's words. Um, don't report something that is allegedly. You know how Wendy Williams used to say allegedly? <laughs> no, not something that is alleged. Um, something that that person told you. But then if there is something that you are concerned about, you make sure that you put in your report that that is something you're concerned about, that you ask that question and it just, you know, you weren't able to, um, they, they didn't answer that question. You have to make this, you have to dress it up and make it plain. I'm talking about make these people a sandwich. I have done investigations. Please make it a sandwich for me. I need meat, bread, lettuce, tomato, pickles. I need it all. That's how I'm going to be able to help your adult or your child. I need it all. Give me some chips on the side if you have it. Um, trust your gut. Um, don't give in to your fears. Document everything. Even after you have had that conversation with that person, continue to document and continue to put that in your notes so that if you need to make another um, report, you can say, hey, since I made my first report, this is such this right here has happened. Right. Because you never they're not going to come to you and say, hey, this is what happened in our first report, unless something else is going on, they may, you know, get to you depending on, they have uh, 24 hours, 72 hours, and almost a week to get back to you depending on what the doc, what the um, report is about. What if they said they've already reported it, reported again, 
Mm -hmm. That's what goes into that database. It, it bounces up to the database. Remember what I was telling you about that database? This is what you need. You need to know who the perpetrator is. You need to know who that person is, what their birthday is, because all that stuff goes up to the cloud and it bounces back down. If you have all the information, it's most likely that um, it will be investigated more often than not. When you get that disclosure, take care of yourself because you may have heard something that you never heard before. I'm trying to talk fast because I think I got one more slide. Um, <laughs> and then remember your core guiding ethical concepts, self-determination, informed consent, and self-determination, of course, for adults, that they get to make their own decisions. You don't get to make decisions for them. But for a child, you have to use a little more decorum and a little more help with these kids. Um, conflict of interest, if the perpetrator is your cousin twice removed, you still have to make the report, but you can stay removed from anything else that happens. Boom, I'm done. Well, you've got some questions, I'm afraid. Is there a gray area for the time frame that DHR has to follow up, interview the at-risk individual, or is it strictly seven calendar days? Mm, okay. Um, if it's an immediate, they have to go out within 24 hours. Well, as a matter of fact, that's not even true. Mm. If it's an immediate, they have to go now. They have to go now. Um, they have to lay eyes on the child. They have to lay eyes on where that child's going to sleep. Um, if it is not an immediate, they have seven calendar days. Um, I'm not talking business days. I said calendar days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If it happened on a Friday, we'll see you on Saturday morning. I will okay. be there to flush the light, flush the flush the toilet, turn on the light, look under the bed. Mm -hmm. Ms. O'Brien says she would always put the contact information down for who told her the info. That way, DHR can contact them as the one who was initially told the information. Since I was reporting for an RMD or RN, I also gave them the DHR reporting form and educated them that they, too, are mandatory reporters. This helped so much in pediatric clinic I was at. I was a contract social worker and did not work for their company, but saw patients there. They started making their own reports. Congratulations to you. Yes, you have to got a couple of great in. jobs. Let me, because we're at the end, read again for those who aren't able to see the screen, our link, and let you know our password today is DUTY, with a capital D, D-U-T-Y, DUTY. Uh, and our link for that password is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters y g as in girl j as in juliet r s as in samantha nine three that is our link. Our password is DUTY with a capital D-U-T-Y. Thank, Thank you so you much, Dr. Brown. I appreciate it. been wonderful having you again. We're a little bit over. Do you have anything else to add? No, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate it. I know some of the things that I said were a little controversial, but thank you for hearing me out. Uh, and again, uh, you'll be joining us in November, I believe, with seasonal depression. And on Monday, uh, following Monday, a week from today, we'll have Dr. Rebecca Sipma, who's with the UAB Movement Disorder Clinic, uh, discussing various types of dementia. Thank you all for everyone who was here today. I hope you have a great week. Thank you, Dr. Brown, so much as always. We appreciate you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon.